Welcome to Saturdays at 7, Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. My name is Todd Rehm. I have the privilege of serving as the publisher for Christian Scholars Review and as the host for Saturdays at 7. I also have the privilege of serving on the faculty and the administration at Indiana Wesleyan University. Our guest is Jim Gash, president of Pepperdine University. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My pleasure. Thanks, Todd. Would you please begin by introducing Tumasimi Henry and the friendship that the two of you eventually uh, found a way to share? Yeah, happy to do so. Henry is a, a Ugandan, and he was in prison in Uganda in 2010 when I first met him in January of 2010 on my first trip to Uganda. He and about, uh, there were 21 of them, 21 teenagers who had been arrested and uh, were warehoused in something called, that's called a juvenile remand home in Uganda, where they were waiting for someone to do something. Uh, when I first went out there and met with him, he was one of two of the prisoners who spoke English. Uh, we didn't actually plan that well enough to bring an interpreter with us. Uh, we thought that since Uganda is an English speaking country, at least in theory, it, it is that, that we were going to be fine t coming and talking to the prisoners. And so there was a group of four lawyers who went out there, uh, really set up by Bob Goff uh, to go out there and see if we could bring their, their cases to, to fruition, give them access to justice. So that's where I first met Henry. Yeah. Can you describe then how your friendship with him then impacted your formation as an attorney and as a legal scholar? Yeah, so what happened is uh, he was one of the two interpreters. He was a really smart kid. He was uh, 16 at the time when we met. Um, he turned 17 a couple months later. But we, we, had, been, we had been thrust together. What we thought was, was later kind of a, a divine collision, a, a God-organized uh, opportunity for us to spend time together. And so he, he was the interpreter, but he was also an inmate. He was someone who had been charged with two counts of murder uh, on two separate occasions. One prior to him going in there, uh, where, where a herdsman and their family had taken, stolen the money and the villagers had brutally killed the herdsman. And that's kind of how you do justice in the developing world where you don't have a strong rule of law. So his family had been arrested and then, and uh, he was waiting for a trial. He'd been there nearly two years when I met him. Wow. And then he, he was charged with another murder of a, an inmate who had uh, tried to escape. And since Henry was in charge, he was the katikira, which is Swahili for prime minister. He was the one who, who, uh, who ran out and brought the prisoner back. And then the matron ordered the four most recent arrivals, which did not include Henry, Ooh. to give him 40 strokes to the buttocks, uh, after which he had, a, an, had an asthma attack. And he had had asthma. And so running away was a problem. Anyway, he was charged with those two murders. So as, as the cases unfolded, as we prepared their cases for, for resolution in the Ugandan trial court system, the first case was dismissed when it finally came to, to court because the evidence was all clear that he and his family were not involved in this murder. His father was still in prison the entire time as well, those two years, as was his younger brother. When the second case came to trial, uh, there was some, some well, we'll just call things that don't happen in the United States, where one, one lawyer represents both the matron who had ordered the, what they call strokes, um, beatings on the buttocks, and Henry were both charged with murder. One, one lawyer represented them both. He was not allowed to testify. She testified against him and said it was him. He was, I, I wasn't involved. So they were both convicted of murder, which then led to um, my second trip to Uganda immediately thereafter and then led to me becoming his attorney of record in the Ugandan Court of Appeals, where I got to argue his case in the Court of Appeals. Ultimately, he was exonerated and uh, is now, then went to medical school yeah. and is now uh, a doctor in Uganda. And I, I've, in fact, I, I talked to him every week or so, and we talked this morning on our, our weekly catch up. And so he is now performing uh, cesarean section births. He's the only doctor within 30 miles in, in this uh, rural area. And, uh, you know, he is fixing people after car accidents and having doing other surgical procedures and saving lives in his community. And uh, one of the strongest people of faith that I know. Yeah. Wow. That's quite a story. In what ways did that friendship then also impact the programmatic opportunities that Pepperdine's Caruso School of Law affords its students? 
and then its yes. graduates afford the clients they serve. Well, what happened was what the students were doing is what affected me. I, I didn't, I wasn't planning on ever going to Uganda. We had students who started going in 2007, again, following Bob Goff. Bob's like, hey, we're going to have a judicial conference. You should come. And so we had uh, a bunch of students who went with Bob. And then ultimately that led to uh, us creating this, um, this Sudro Global Justice Institute where where our students continue to serve the local Ugandan population by engaging in plea bargaining and conferences and, and doing a variety of legal efforts and procedures to bring justice to the people of Uganda. So what that did is, is the students' engagement, their desire to go with Bob and then to bring me in. I was dean of students at the time. Like, I, I, you guys go, you know, I'll support you. I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll give you money. But, you know, that's for other people, you know. There, there they, Lord, send them was kind of my, my Bible verse that was, yeah, hey, we'll send them. And then, and then came a time when, when they were able to convince the dean of students to go with the students to Africa. And uh, I've now been 29 times. And so oh, no. it's and yeah, with my family and I moved there for six months in 2012 to help them launch uh, this system of plea bargaining in their criminal justice system. And then, uh, and then now other countries are calling Rwanda. So we're now active in Rwanda, helping them. The first plea bargains ever were done uh, two years ago in Rwanda with Pepperdine students being involved. And then uh, Ghana uh, has, has called. And we, we now have a full-time presence in Uganda and Ghana on the ground, soon to be full-time presence in Rwanda. Nigeria is the next they've called. We've, we've, we've spent some time there. And then Ethiopia and Tanzania. Uh, and Malawi are saying, if they can do it, then so can we. So our students really have led the way, and they're in the midst of now, you know, going that they leave on Tuesday, as in two days. Well, by the time this is actually uh, published, uh, they will be there. So yeah. we, we send about 15 students spring break and over the summer, and then we send about uh, about a half dozen lawyers go with them. And so each team is an American lawyer and, a, and an American law student, Pepperdine student, the Ugandan lawyer and a Ugandan law student. And they work in the prisons, in the actual prisons, uh, working with the prisoners, preparing their cases for, for resolution, either through trial or through plea bargaining. And wow. uh, we've done about, about uh, 5,000 cases since we started doing this. And the Ugandans have done more than 50,000. I mean, like we try to help them you know, tra tra train the trainers, so to speak, and then they move forward. And then, and then there's international conferences. And, and next weekend, Actually, the weekend that this is going to be broadcast, uh, we will have 20 chief justices from the continent of Africa flying into Kampala for a training, oh, wow. a two-day training on, on uh, the civil side of dispute resolution, mediation. And so Pepperdine's Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution at the law school is the leading institute for dispute, res dispute resolution in the country. And as a result of that, uh, there's going to be a, a spreading of pre-trial dispute resolution techniques, both in, both in the criminal and civil justice system to decongest the courts and to decongest the prisons. And so that's what, that's what we do. And our students are in the middle of all of it. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great draw to our campus for incoming students. Well, that's wonderful. What an impact. What an impact. I want to ask you then now too, at what point did you know that your friendship would be the source of your first book, Divine Collision, and then the subsequent film, Remand? Yeah. Well, what happened was in, uh, I think it was 2015. I'd been going there. No, it, it, was, it was 2014. I've been going there for, for about four years. And when I was there, I would periodically, you know, post on Facebook or, you know, some, some sort of like, here's the update with what's happening in prison today. And at some point I had some friends who said, you got to write this down. Like there's, there's too many things that are happening that you won't remember. And, and another thing, you know, Bob Goff told me, you know, if, if you don't remember it, it's like it never happened. And so he writes everything down so he can remember it. And I thought that's a really good idea. So I had been doing daily updates for my friends and family. And then, and then I think in 2014, I decided, you know what, I'm going to, um, I want to try and string this together. I talked to one of our alums who's an agent, a book agent and, and said, well, what do you think? And he said, great story. You just got to learn how to write. I mean, I wrote legal briefs. So I, I, I don't need a legal brief. I need a story. I'm kind of like blank stare. And he <laughs> said, 
uh, no architect drawings, paintings. I need to, <laughs> I need to hear, hear this, the way you heard, see the sights that, you know, smell and like experience this as opposed to, and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened, which is kind of what lawyers do in analytical. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to do it myself. I didn't want to have a ghostwriter. I, I, you know, if I'm going to write a book, I'm going to, I'm going to write the book. And so I spent a year or so reading really good writing. Mm. You know, read 125 New York Times bestsellers. Just like, okay, what does it look like? And then wrote a book on storytelling. And then, and then um, Henry and I decided we were going to do this together. And so it's dual first person. It's my perspective and then his perspective, and then my perspective, and then his perspective. Some different continents, different times that ultimately collide together through God, we believe, and then kind of how our stories uh, unfolded together, how he became a doctor, how I became a university president, both as a result of us being collided together by God. And then, of course, the film was a just a, a friend saying, you got to tell the story. Can, can, can you get... Can you get um, access to bring cameras inside the prison? Mm -hmm. The answer is, well, but we've developed enough trust with the Ugandans that they do trust us to tell stories accurately and honestly and not in a way that are, are uh, condescending. And, and so ultimately, they, they, uh, they allowed us to film in the prisons to tell Henry's story, but also to tell the story of a country's evolution of providing access to justice for its people. And so the filmmakers wove those together and ultimately it led to the final scene. Uh, I shouldn't ruin it, but let's just say it ended very well for <laughs> a, a young boy who had been charged with murder. And uh, we, we were able to film the time that I first was able to read the verdict, the, the appellate decision to him. We were live streaming and got it filmed when he found out that his life, uh, behind bars, his life of having a conviction for murder on his record, that was all going to change. And, and, and it, it opened up everything for him, for what he's doing now. Yeah. Thank you. It's an amazing uh, story of how friendship uh, can carry and impact uh, people in positive ways that we never would have imagined uh, when that friendship first started. So thank you for sharing. Now, I'll tell you, I would not be I would not be president of Pepperdine University had I not met him. I mean, when the when the when the process began to unfold uh, for the next president, I'm the, the eighth. When the seventh president stepped down, uh, there was a there were you know the board put together a list of things they were looking for, and many of the things they ultimately were looking for happened in my life as a result of meeting him. Yeah. You know, fundraising, entrepreneurial, global. Speaking, writing, uh, there, there was just a, a uh, you know, felt like Slumdog Millionaire where, where all these things happen and you look back and say, well, that was the pathway that got us here. Yeah. And it was not something that I didn't uh, set out to be the Pepperine's president. I yeah. wanted to be a law professor for the rest of my life and loved every moment of it. And then um, the way things unfolded, it put me in a position for the board to think for such a time as this, the experiences I had with Henry and with the country of Uganda and the continent of Africa led to uh, their selecting me to take the baton. Yeah, thank you. If I may, I want to ask you a little bit about that pathway to being a, a law professor uh, yeah. and uh, your formation for that. Uh, you earned an undergraduate degree in finance from Abilene Christian University and then went to law school at Pepperdine. At what point did you know you were called to steward the law? And were there any experiences persons, readings that shaped that calling? Yeah, well, at ACU, Abilene Christian, where I went, um, I was a finance major, as you mentioned, and uh, crammed four years into four and a half. So I graduated in four and a half years, played out my eligibility. I was, I was a football player, played out my eligibility. Okay. And during that last semester, my, my second senior year, but it was only half of a senior year, I, I was in a business law class and the professor put a transparency on the screen. You know, it's, PowerPoint before there was PowerPoint. And it said that the dean of Pepperdine's law school was coming out the, you know, the following week to interview anybody who was potentially interested in going to law school. And oh. there was a scholarship for one Abilene Christian University student. The dean at the time, Ron Phillips, is also a graduate of Abilene Christian. And, and, and there would be, you know, kind of a, a, a 
con contest is the wrong word, an application process for this scholarship. Being like, are you interested? So at that point, I was, I was not thinking about going to law school, but I, I really liked my business law class. Yeah. I thought, let, let, me go, let me go meet with this guy because all I knew about law school was how hard it was. And yeah. as someone who, you know, whose parents are both public school teachers and, and no one in the family had gone to law school or no one, I, I didn't know any lawyers growing up. I just thought like, well, that's way too hard. But then I sat down with Ron, uh, Dean Phillips, and he told me about Pepperdine's academic program, about its, its professors. My parents had gone to Pepperdine undergrad. And so this is one of those okay. things that I'd always hoped to go to Pepperdine. And I would have gone to Pepperdine for undergrad if they had a football team. We had a football team. And, and, and that, unfortunately, it's not going to happen, at least not under my watch. Um, <laughs> so so uh, we had this great conversation. And at that point, I felt like, actually, I think this is possible. I think this is possible. But I was engaged to be married at the time. And my, my wife was a, was in Abilene Christian as well. And so we to figure out, okay, if I went out to, to Pepperdine for law school, would she be able to transfer and finish up at Pepperdine? And, mm -hmm. you know, she was from my hometown in California. So it was great to, for her to go back as well. And it ended up that I, I, I applied for the scholarship. I was awarded the scholarship. And so I got tuition paid at the law school. She, she's the smart one in the family. So she got a full scholarship to, to Pepperdine as well. And that allowed us to say, okay, we can do this. And I will tell you that I loved law school. I mean, I loved law school. And so after the first semester, when things went my way in terms of, you know, you, we, uh, there's a lot of things I, I love to sing and I can't sing at all. I'm a horrible singer. So <laughs> me loving law school wasn't necessarily going to translate to success in law school. But when the first yeah. semester grades came out and it turned out that my love for law school and what, what the professors were looking for on exams meshed. And so at that point, I set out to become a law professor at Pepperdine. You know, I only applied to one law school, go to law school. Yeah. And I only wanted to teach at one law school. And so I got to know um, the dean better and just said, what, what would a pathway that would lead to a life in the law, a law professor job, what would that look like? And then my torts professor, Bob Brain, I, you know, like, how, how do I go about doing these things yeah. to, uh, to put myself in a position to one day get hired. And so that led to me working for a judge on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, Edith Jones in Houston, post-graduation. It led to me doing some additional things in law school that would bolster my resume. And then to go work for a really, really big law firm in Washington, D.C., uh, mm -hmm. Kirkland and Ellis, that again, allowed, allowed for that box to be checked, get, get experienced the highest level in the practice of law, came then, then out to Pepperdine or, or to, uh, to the Los Angeles office of that same uh, law firm. Mm. And uh, then when, when the call came during my sixth year of law practice, uh, was a, it was, okay, are you ready? Because uh, we're ready. If you're interested, we're interested. I'm like, I'm interested still. <laughs> um, and that led to me coming in to, to teach in the fall of 99. So the fall of 99, six wow. years post-grad, uh, 20 years to the day before I became president is when I started as a law professor at Pepperdine. That's great. Thank you. In your estimation then, what virtues are most essential to your understanding and practice of the Christian academic vocation as a legal scholar? And perhaps what vices also need to be refused with the greatest vigilance? There, there's a lot in that question. So I'll just start unpacking and, and follow up as, as you'd like. So one of the things that um, I have found in my life and, and only later internalized was that the price for excellence is discipline. Mm. Like if you want to be excellent at anything, at least for me, some people naturally are really good at things. Uh, for me, it was discipline. And so I was an athlete growing up and, and the, you know, the idea of making sure that you were fully prepared when you walked onto the field. It became clear to me. Uh, same, same thing in law school. The, one of the reasons I did very well in law school was it turned out that the harder you studied, the more, um, the more disciplined you were in how you studied, the better off you did. And so yeah. discipline is a critical part of that. Um, you know, perseverance, uh, you learn as an athlete, when things are hard, do it again. 
And yeah, I don't want to do it again. I'm tired. I, I'm, I'm physically tired. I'm exhausted. Like, do it again. You want to be excellent at this? Do it again. So discipline, mm -hmm. perseverance. I think also having a longer view of, of what you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. Something that's right in front of you. One of the things that we did with our kids and, and it was only later in life did they, they, they say, hey, when you did this to, for us, like, were you trying to like, uh, hey, you're catching on. Like often we, we, we would put the dessert, you know, we would put the dessert in front of them yeah. and say, you can't eat it right now. It's going to be there for five minutes right there in front of you. Delayed gratification. We're teaching yeah. you delayed gratification. And okay. that's part of, I think, a critically missing part of, of our society right now is the understanding of delayed gratification. It's yeah. it, not just that it's right in front of you and you want it. What are the things that are necessary in order for you to, to appreciate that or to, to, to train yourself, to discipline yourself, to, do, to have a longer view of things? One of the challenges that I, that I have faced in my life, and I'm not the only one, is, is um, procrastination. You know, just, just uh, I, I know I can get it done. Yeah, I know I can get it done in, yep. in you know, a, a 20, it'll take me 24 hours to, to get this thing done and i've got four weeks and and so am i going to be doing you know six hours a week can we can we, can we figure out that way or are we going to do okay we're going to wait until two weeks before and we'll do 12 hours a week and then no oh, well the, the the week of okay i can do 24 hours in this week and then you know that's how i did too often i did uh writing assignments in college well that didn't work in law school Right. And so learning, learning to fight against procrastination and, and learning to, and boy, when you write a book, man, you just, you, you can't procrastinate when you're doing scholarly uh, research. You know, I, I learned when I, when I did uh, quite a bit of writing while I was a law professor for the six years before I became president, learning to, to really do some every day, make progress every day. And, and resist the temptation to pr procrastinate. And then finally, I'll say, uh, trying to resist the temptation to compare oneself to those around you. Yeah. And that, you know, that, that's, that's what social media has taught this generation, uh, a, a really, really bad lesson. The, the, the lesson is, is be looking what everybody else is doing at every time and compare yourself to somebody's best moment of their best day exaggerated. And then, and then see how, how much you can feel left out or how insecure you can make yourselves you know, yeah. by, by comparing. And so trying, trying to say, I'm competing against my desire for excellence, not against the person down the hall or across the, the way or across the country. Just trying to, to say, hey, what God, God, what do you have for me? Let me run toward that and, and not uh, worry about meeting somebody else's expectations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to transition now to talk about uh, your service as Pepperdine's president. You mentioned that if it wasn't for that friendship and the things that you learned and the experiences that you accumulated, uh, the board and the search committee would not have been interested in you, but that that helped cultivate that side of your vocation. Prior to that, you served as the associate dean for strategic planning and external relations for the law school. For you, though, what was it when they came and asked that said, yes, this is next in my sort of vocational discernment process and how God has called me uh, to be utilized in this world? Thanks for letting me unpack that. So my, for, for my first six years as professor, I just taught. Like, that's all I did and, and you know, taught and wrote and did everything. I wasn't involved in administration. And then during my sixth year is when uh, somebody who I'd gotten to know in private practice and to become a mentor and friend, Ken Starr, became the dean of Pepperdine Law mm -hmm. School. And he said, he asked me in March of my sixth year, will you join my administrative team as the associate dean for student life, academic, social, spiritual life of the law school? And yeah. so that was a, uh, okay, I said, yeah, but I, I, let me get over tenure first. That's coming next month. And he said, I know, but like, a, it, things going to be fine. You know, you, you're, you're where you need to be. So then I did that for seven years. I was, I was Dean of Students Associate. So I taught part-time and administrated the rest of the time. And that's when I started traveling to, to Uganda and, and other places in Africa. And then went back to full-time teaching for a time after Ken left for Baylor. 
and uh, then join, rejoin in 17 uh, as associate dean for strategic planning and external relations, fundraising mm -hmm. and, and alumni and things of that nature. And so all of that kind of lined up to where when, when the board announced or when my, my, predece my predecessor announced in 18, so a year, a little over a year into my time uh, in my second stint in administration, that he was stepping down. You know, the process began of speculating like always happens. And the last four Pepper and presidents were the executive vice president. And so hmm. every, you know, the executive vice president, Gary Hansen, who would have been a phenomenal president, he just said, you know, I'm, I'm out. I'm, 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 I'm at a place in my career that I'm not looking for that. Yeah. And so then, you know, you start having conversations with people. I had thought at one point that I was, I was going to be the dean of the Pepperdine Law School. It seemed like things were moving in that direction for me mm -hmm. on that career path. But when this opportunity arose, uh, my wife and I spent a lot of time praying about it and decided, you know, I I'm not actually going to apply because the, the search firm said there's going to be, the, the board said there's going to be applications and there's going to be nominations. Mm -hmm. So we decided that if I was the only one who thought I should be president, well, then I shouldn't be president. And I've got some self-awareness problem. <laughs> and, and so we thought, okay, if, if it's meant to be, then, then we don't have to push the door open. Then, then, you know, so when I got the call from the search firm saying, you know, you've got these nominations, are you, are you willing to move forward? We sat down with each of our kids individually because we had two kids at Pepperdine at that time. One had graduated, two were mm. in school. And so we gave all three of them an individual veto power. And said, if, if you decide this is not what you had in mind for your college experience, because dad being a law professor is very different than dad being the president. Right. And, and each, all three of them were quite encouraging. And then we just decided, okay, big job, bigger God. If, if this is meant to be, then, then he will prepare us. Yeah. And, and as it unfolded, we, we, we just took a step at a time. And when I got this call, then, then we felt like we were mentally prepared for this. And if mm -hmm. you look back on this, uh, I'm the first Pepperdine grad to be president of Pepperdine. Yeah. My, my eight predecessors, seven predecessors, all knew Pepperdine well, other than the first one, you know, where there wasn't such a thing as Pepperdine. But I had had the unique opportunity to see Pepperdine from so many different angles. My parents had gone to Pepperdine, met, fall in love. My dad became a Christian in Pepperdine. Like we grew up with Pepperdine being, you know, the, the, the brass ring we were reaching toward. Uh, it ended up that all of us played sports that it just didn't work to go to Pepperdine. I'd been a Pepperdine kid. I'd been a Pepperdine student. I'd been a Pepperdine spouse. I'd been a Pepperdine parent. I'd been a professor. I'd been an administrator. And so there was, there was this 360 view of Pepperdine yeah. that I brought to the table that um, none of my predecessors did through no fault of their own. They brought a whole lot of things that I didn't bring that were, were very uh, important to the job. But that's kind of how it ended up happening is, is for such a time as this, I was, I was the person that fit the profile they were looking for. Yeah. In what ways has your background as an attorney served you well as a university president? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think the analytical reasoning that we're trained both in law school and trained on the job to do, to, mm -hmm. to look at it, a problem from every angle, involve those around you, to ensure that you're getting a, a, a thorough 360 view of, of what's happening, uh, that has been quite helpful. I think the collaborative nature of a lot of the work that lawyers do has been really helpful. You know, people have often asked me, well, you know, what's, your leadership, what's your leadership style? Relational, collaborative, deliberative, decisive. So relational. Get to know everybody you're working with. Make sure that you, you know their spouses, they know your spouses, you know each other's kids, you know each other's lives. And so there's a trust that's built around relationships. Collaborative, get the right people in the room mm -hmm. for, for like, you know, when we'll just use COVID. COVID happens, like, ah, what do we do? Well, I know, I know a little bit about a lot. There's a lot of people who know a lot about a little bit. We need to get yeah. those people in the room. And so get them around the problem. Make sure you've got the right people in the room uh, who have a relationship with each other of trust. So then you can deliberate. So you can, you can hit it from every side and have everybody who is accountable for that particular aspect to be able to have a, a say in that. And, and really, uh, without, with no holds barred, no one wondering, you know, gee, am I going to say something that the president doesn't like? And, and like, no, say, say, 
I, yeah. I, I can't make the decision ultimately decisive. I need to be the one that makes the decision. I'm the one who's accountable to the board for the decisions we make. You're accountable to me for these areas. So I, I, I can't make my best decision for the board unless you're making, give me your best advice. So relational collaborative, deliberate, decisive, that's how we do things. That's how you did things in the law, in the law as well. That's how you do things in the, in the, on, the, um, uh, on the football field. Like this is a team that needs to bring, have everybody bring their particular part of expertise or their particular A game to the game so that ultimately the coach, the decision maker can make the right decision. The lead lawyer can make the right decision who then is accountable to the client. And so it just felt like this, is, this was what I was made to do is to analyze things. And, and so one quick example, there was a, a, a preclusion of graduations in 2020. And then in 2021, like we, we didn't get to have graduation because everybody was home and, and, oh, you can't get people together, even outside. So in 2021, in California, we were still shut down for the entire academic year from, from fall of 20 to, to spring of 21. But were we going to do a graduation? And the answer was, in February, no one was allowed to do graduation. So school after school after school canceled their graduation. We thought, you know, our, our, our position was decide quickly if the answer is yes, but give yourself time. Don't say no unless and until you have to. And so we held longer than most schools. And in, by the end of March, we're like, okay, we can make this work. We're going to have a graduation. So a lot of our colleagues in California did not have graduations. We had a graduation because we continued to evaluate on, a, on an ongoing basis so, so that we could ultimately have the graduations for 20 and 21 together. And so it's wow. this team effort of ensuring that the events team, when do you really need to know? You want to know now when do you need to know. Yeah. And, you know, for, for all the, the rentals anyway, so a, a team based uh, analytical reasoning, everybody brings their game like I'd been trained in the law to do. Yeah. Thank you. Pepperdine was originally established a few miles south of downtown Los Angeles. But, and in, then its main campus moved in the early 1970s to Malibu, widely known for 21 miles of coastline and neighbors such as Martin Sheen. What opportunities then come with leading an institution in such a well-known and beautiful location? Yeah, well, um, one of my predecessors used to say, Pepperdine is the kind of campus that God would have built if only he could afford it. <laughs> and so it's this, it's this 800 acre, I mean, it's worth literally billions of dollars on the open market if you could divide it, you know, subdivide it and, and uh, sell it to the rich and famous. And so it's got massive convening power, massive convening power. You can bring people out to campus and say, hey, let's have a gathering in Malibu. In Malibu, you know, particularly in January, February, when people, you know, where you are, are, are kind of shivering a bit. You know, like, oh, it's no, we here. love January. What are you talking yeah. <laughs> about? Yeah. Shovel more and, snow, more, yeah, more better. And, and, and so th that, that creates an opportunity to, to be a draw to students yeah. and to faculty and to speakers and to administrators um, and to conferences. And so it, it's easy to get people to come where you are and expose them to your community. When they're exposed to your community, they say, well, you guys, you guys are actually serious about your Christian faith. You know, I, I, I just presume because you're in Malibu and you're in California that you guys aren't that serious. And, and maybe some experiences in the distant past caused them to wonder whether we were committed to our Christian faith. And, and, uh, I don't think anybody wonders that anymore who actually pays attention to what's happening at Pepperdine and what we're doing. So there's that convening power. There's also uh, the, you know, th there's the other side of that. Where like, are, are you interested in coming to Pepperdine because we're near the beach? Or are you interested in coming to be transformed by uh, a group of faculty members who are going to love you and mentor you and discipline you and, and, and equip you to lead? And so there's, there's that dual, uh, you know, the, the double-edged sword. We also have campuses all around the globe, and, and that's another phenomenal thing for Pepperdine. We have a campus in Switzerland, Google, Pepperdine Swiss Castle, 90 acres overlooking Lake Geneva. We're in Florence. We're in London. We're in Buenos Aires. We're in Heidelberg. 
Uh, we've got a campus four blocks from the White House in Washington, D.C. We, we, yeah. dis, we bring our, our, our students to Malibu and then send them, 80% of our students study abroad while they're at, at Pepperdine, send them around the globe. And so, uh, you know, there, there's, there's that as well. There's a presumption, again, that we're not serious about our faith that, that is overcome when people come to campus. So those are some of the things that, that uh, Malibu uh, brings. It's, it's both a positive and, and, and a question mark for people. In terms of the last sort of questions uh, for us, for our conversation today, I want to ask about the religious fabric then of Pepperdine and how it's nurtured. Since the university's founding in 1937, Part of how that identity has been nurtured is the result of the relationship it shares with the Churches of Christ or the Restoration Movement. In what ways does that relationship then impact how you view the fiduciary nature of leadership that you and the board of regents afford the university? Yeah, the, the um, George Pepperdine was, was a man of deep faith who grew up and was committed to this Restoration Movement, the Churches of Christ. And so he established Pepperdine not as a, a, a sectarian school, meaning that you know, everybody had to, to, to sign a statement of faith or everybody had to be Church of Christ. That's never been the case with Pepperdine. It will never be the case with Pepperdine. The churches of Christ are very low church in, in, in the terms of, of there's not a governing creed. There's no sort of everybody has to agree with this. There's no hierarchy. There's no leadership structure. It's congregational autonomy all over the the country all over the world. And so there's, it's a kind of a, a looser thing than being, for example, Catholic, where, you know, you've got a hierarchy, you've got some, some, uh, some principles that are governing. There's the church, there's a church that meets on campus. There's actually two churches of Christ that meet, meet on campus, but n- neither is, is, um, is over the university. The university is not over the church. They're kind of side by side. Now, there's only two people, according to Pepperdine's bylaws, who need to be active members of a congregation of the Churches of Christ, the chair of the Board of Regents and the president. Hmm. And so uh, and the majority of the Board of Regents have to be uh, members of a congregation of the Church of Christ, but only a bare majority have to be. So we've, we've learned, we, the whole higher education, have learned that one does not, once a school does not maintain a serious Christian faith over time, unless one of two things is true. This is uh, Birchall's Dying of the Light. Phenomenal book. If, if people haven't read that, I, I highly recommend it. But over the, the whole history of American higher education, there's only two ways that um, mm-hmm. have, have worked. One is a, is a statement of faith that the, the board, the faculty, and even the students sign, and everybody agrees to this. Well, Churches of Christ are non-creedal. That's, that will never happen. It never has happened, never will happen. The second way is a denominational affiliation that, that kind of anchors you to a particular point. Many schools that were, they were a, for example, they were a, a Presbyterian school, and then they were a Protestant school, and then they were a Christian school, and then they were a religious school, and then they're nothing because it just drifted, 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 drifted because there wasn't that tie to Presbyterianism. Yeah. Well, that's, that's Pepperdine. We have to keep a tie to the Churches of Christ, not because we want to be a Church of Christ school, is we want to be a Christian school, a seriously Christian school. And there's only two ways to do it. Maybe we're different. Maybe we're the only one in the history of the world who would be able to do it without that. And yet there's a whole bunch of schools who had a bunch of, who had those maybes and now, you know, they're Harvard and Yale and Vanderbilt. You, know, you go down the line and say, like, none of them held on without one of those two things. So my fiduciary duty to Pepperdine as a board member myself and as someone who has been, been tasked to keep Pepperdine as a Christian institution is to ensure we remain rooted in the churches of Christ. Again, not to be a church of Christ school, but in order to be a Christian school. And so that's, that's kind of the, the, the main tie to to the churches of Christ there at, at Pepperdine is to ensure that we remain a Christian school. Now, what that means to be Church of Christ means that we're very much um, dedicated to, to Bible study, very much dedicated to prayer. But the, the, the Bible is, is, the, is the Word of God, the inspired Word of God that's authoritative in its, in its teachings. Um, there's there's a, a belief in, in regular congregational gatherings. So there's a lot of the things that, that one would think of as Orthodox Christian 
that are, are very Church of Christ. And so that's what we do. We have an active, vibrant worship culture on campus. We have these two churches on campus. We have uh, required convocation for the first chapel for the first two years of their school. They've got three Bible classes, religion classes they have to take. Uh, we have a, a culture of, of uh, Bible studies across campus. Every dorm has a spiritual life advisor, a peer student, spiritual life advisor. And so we're re remaining rooted to our Christian faith through the churches of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pepperdine 2030 then now, Ascend Together, the university's current strategic plan, quote, calls for the university to become a preeminent global Christian university, end quote, as defined by six strategic objectives and goals. And if I may, I'll, I'll na name those six. Academic excellence, vibrant community, transform students, strengthen sense of belonging, local and global impact, and operational excellence. In the challenging environment in which higher education finds itself today, which objective do you think is the most challenging of those to pursue? In, in some sense, they're, they're all challenging and they're all accessible. I mean, I'll, I'll just say that if you look at the, the, the current higher education scrutiny that, that the, the America is getting, like that the higher education, conference of higher education is dropping. Now, it's not dropping any faster than confidence in, in government and the police and in yeah. and, and religion generally. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are dropping. But it's really from two things. The value, like cost-benefit analysis, is higher education worth it? Uh, so a chunk of people attacking from that. And then values. Are the values that we see in higher education, do those match? And so for us, the way we do higher education, high touch, high mentorship, international, uh, really strong academic, serious faith, that is not something that you can do on the cheap, so to speak. And so, so ensuring that we're maintaining the excellence we strive for, the academic excellence we strive for, uh, in, in the face of the cost of higher education is a challenge. And, and yet, I would say, among those that I have to, to, to pick as the most challenging, I would say maintaining a, a community of belonging in the face of a polarizing, polarized, politically um, cancel culture world to ensure that every single student knows that they are, are created in the image of God and that we love them just the way they are. We, we accept them the way they are, that accepting and affirming are different things. And so we accept them just the way they are and we welcome them into a community and having them feel like, well, you know, if, if, if I'm not a follower of Christ, do I belong here? The answer is, of course, you belong here. We want you, you're a child of God. You may not be following God. You may not be on a, your own spiritual journey right now, but we, we see you that way and we want you here. You are, are an important part of our community. And so there's, there, there's a tendency among uh, a certain population to say, unless you agree with me on certain issues that they put at the top of their list, then you're saying that I don't belong. And, and so that's, that's one of the challenges there is ensuring that we communicate effectively that, no, you belong, uh, that you're included, that you're part of God's uh, creation. You know, this Revelation 7 vision where people from every tribe, tongue, nation, ethnicity are gathered together and singing with one voice, you know, praising, praising God together with one voice. So the whole idea of, of everyone belonging, that's what we call it. We have a, a vice president for community belonging. You know, some, hmm. some, some schools have a, a different set of uh, acronyms they use for, for making sure people feel like they belong, but that's, that's what we, we use. And I would say that's the one that we're, in, we're always focusing on making sure we're doing that well, but the culture that we live in tries to put us into different camps and we want to be in one camp. That's, that's the image of God and Pepperdine waves. Thank you. For our last question then, uh, for our conversation, as the president, in what ways do you strive to cultivate a community in which the university's identity as preeminent, global, and Christian strengthen and advance one another instead of competing with each other? Yeah, that's, that's the thing that, that uh, too often the secular world says you cannot be excellent academically if you are, if you're, tethered to faith or, 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 or you, you espouse the faith. We just reject that. That's just not true. These things are inextricable from each other. You, know, you, can, you can think of a lot of analogies of, 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 the, of the, a ladder where these, these are the, the, the 
parallel piers of academic excellence and Christian faith. You can think of a rope that's woven together. Uh, we just think that we are called as followers of Christ to be excellent in everything that we do. And there's no, there's no sort of excuse. There's, mediocrity is not acceptable. Everything we do is tied to giving our best, doing our best for the cause of Christ. And we, we don't apologize for that. We don't shy away from that. But, but it's not, it's not the, the natural order of things for the world to accept that these things are congruous. And we, are, we argue and live uh, in a way that says, no, these things are integrated. All of this is integrated. Faith and learning are integrated. Uh, following Christ and, and being disciplined in your, in your academics and in your scholarship, these are the same thing. They're indivisible. Yeah. We also talk a lot about freedom. Free, freedom in Christ. We believe in free speech. We believe, believe in academic freedom. We believe in freedom of religion. We believe in, in free enterprise. We ab- believe in, in democratic self-governance, meaning you train a people in the values that this country was built upon, and they will then thrive, and our democracy will thrive, our economy will thrive, if the tenets of the Christian faith, including you know, the golden rule, are, are followed. And so yeah, it's it's a it's it's a it's a non-natural thing in 21st century America, but we're 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 not shying away from it at all. Yeah, thank you very much. Our guest has been Jim Gash, president of Pepperdine University. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights and your wisdom with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Todd. Thank you for joining us for Saturdays at seven. Christian Scholars Review's conversation series with thought leaders about the academic vocation and the relationship that vocation shares with the church. We invite you to join us again next week for Saturdays at 7.